you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Boss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. I'm Oaks Chris Voss here from the Chris Voss Show dot com. There we go. The Iron Lady, when she sings it, that makes the show official. I think that's how it works nowadays and all that good stuff. Thanks for uh, being on the show and, and being part of the show. Our audience is so wonderful. For 15 years, you've been putting up with all of our silliness, our nonsense, our comedy, but br- the brilliant minds that bring you the smartest stuff. I mean, you know, the, the bragging rights that you get being an audience of the Chris Foster is you get to walk around and tell people how intelligent you are. Or maybe maybe don't tell them how intelligent you are, but you share the Chris Foss Show glow, or what we like to call the Globies. We're not calling it that. We're just making that up. The CEOs, the billionaires, the White House the presidential advisors, the governors, the Congress members, the U.S. ambassadors, the astronauts, Pulitzer Prize winners, the people we have on the show bring you the most concentrated conceptualization of intelligence, knowledge, and things that will improve the quality of your life. And I, every show, I just get epiphanies. I learn something new. I learn new terms. Uh, and you would think after all these years and after all these shows that I would have learned it all, but there's still so much to learn. So uh, the, the things you don't know, uh, you don't know are uh, just an endless array of stuff. And so that's what we do on the Chris Foss Show. Maybe we should just rename it Things You Don't Know You Don't Know. <laughs> we have an amazing author on the show. He's joining us today. Uh, and he's going to be talking about his book that just came out on October 4th, 2023. It's called You're Making This Way Too Hard. Find Your Easy Way to Enjoy a Life. We'll get into what that means. Uh, the book uh, has a description warning on it, so we'll, we'll parlay it into the uh, show. It says, warning, do not open this book if you are happy with being unhappy. And we hope that our audience enjoys being happy. So you're going to listen to the wonderful gentleman on the show. Uh, Dr. Angelo Valentini is on the show with us today. He's going to be talking to us about his book, his insights, and uh, his massive amounts of knowledge and i'm telling you folks it's massive i've seen it uh dr angelo valentini is a consulting valenti. what's that valenti please valenti valenti am i getting that right yeah you got it right now yeah there you go doc. uh dr angelo valenti is a consulting psychologist in nashville tennessee he earned his bachelor's degree from case western universe uh you Reserve University, and his MS and PhD from the University of Georgia. He taught psychology at Oakland City University and worked as a consultant with RHR International before opening his own firm in 1982. See, I told you, he's been doing this for a massively long time. Uh, His firm, the company Psychologist, helps companies hire the right people for their cultures, develops talent with their organizations, and coaches present and future leaders. He also coaches individuals who want to live their best personal and professional lives. He's the author, of course, of the latest book that we have for mentioned. Welcome to the show, Angelo. How are you? I'm terrific. How are you, Chris? I am excellent as well. Thanks for coming on the show. Give us your dot coms. Where do you want people to find you on the interwebs? You can find me at angelovalenti.com, uh, thecompanypsychologist.com, you can book a discovery call at reachangelo.com. You can find me on Facebook at Angelo Valenti, LinkedIn, Angelo Valenti PhD, and Instagram, although I still don't use Instagram, but yeah. There you go. You got to love the Instagram. It's a great place for dating. Uh, so uh, give us the 30,000 overview of your uh, new book. The reason I wrote my book, You're Making This Way Too Hard, find your easy way to enjoy life is that I work a lot with executives, organizations, individuals, and just in my personal and professional life, I started noticing that people aren't having as much fun as I thought they should have. (laughs) (laughs) There seems to be a lot of stress going on. What? Um, they're, They're worried about work. They're worried about their relationships. They're worried about 
uh, how many likes they get on social media. They're worried about so many things that I think they forget that we were put on this earth to enjoy life, not to be miserable all the time or not to be worried all the time. I think we have to be taught to be miserable and I don't like it. So I don't want people to be miserable. So that's there you I'm go. Doing. Note to self, stop being miserable, damn it. Right. Homage to uh, Mr. Uh, O'Donnell or McDonald. Uh, and it, uh, so you, you, there's a spelling in the name. I want to clarify. So when people search for this and look it on Amazon to order it, uh, it the, the way you spell enjoy life is with the letters N, joy, and then L, F, E. So enjoy life as it reads. Right. Is there a reason you did it that way? There is a reason. That is my license plate. N, J, O, Y, L, F, E. <laughs> it's been my license plate since 1991 and i've had it on every car since mm -hmm. i've been fortunate in, in my life that i've been i drive some pretty nice cars so mm -hmm. it's always been on kind of, usually mercedes um so i drive around nashville and wherever with enjoy life because i that's a message i want to bring to everybody and it 99.9% .9 of the people that comment on my license plate will say that's a great message with good license plate. Every once in a while, somebody will say, why do you have no joy life <laughs> on your license plate? And oh, I have to correct them and say, why would anybody go around driving with no no joy life on their car? Maybe you're upset at the car dealership or something. Uh, I, I think it's interesting, too. You have a picture of a car. On yeah. the cover of your book with the license plate there and i noticed it comes from the state of contentment is that the 52nd state that we just it should be yeah. <laughs> maybe we should rename one of the states contentment uh that or we could just invade canada well, i'm in tennessee and i feel pretty content here so we can well, there you go. we can go tennessee content maybe we can change the name there uh then no one will be able to find the state they're like where did tennessee go uh, so there you go so give us a thirty thousand overview of what's inside you're making this way too hard I'm not saying you are. I'm just quoting your book. <laughs> uh, give us the 30,000 review. What's inside? Sure. I start the book uh, off with the idea that there are around us systems, large and small, that influence our life. Hmm. Some big systems, governmental system, educational system, um, selective service system used to influence people's lives. But so, and within these big systems, there are a lot of small systems. Your social systems, your your friends are a system. Your family is a system, hmm. and they're all impacting you to one degree or another. And to the extent you let those systems, they can control your life. Hmm. Now, what I'm, my message is, it's okay for some of these systems to influence your life, but it's hmm. not okay for these systems to control your life. Social hmm. media is another in the news media, whatever, is another system that's structured. It's designed, social media is designed for two reasons. One, keep people arguing with one another and to sell a lot of stuff. And, and to the extent that you play into that, mm -hmm. you're either going to be arguing with a lot of people or buying a lot of stuff. And my, what I like to to uh, convey is you can let those systems work for you if you figure them out. Mm. You don't have to be a puppet to the system. In my book, I mentioned in life, you're either the puppet or the puppeteer. Yeah. If you believe you control your own life, you're the puppet. If you believe outside forces control your life, you're the, pu you're the puppet. And if you believe you control your life, you're the puppeteer. So you, it's a choice you can make. There you well, go. Many There's one of the main theme through my book is choice. You have choices uh, where to work, where to live, who to have a relationship with, how to react to situations that happen to you. All of those are choices. You can't choose always what happens to you, but you can choose how you react to what happens to you. Mm. There you go. You can choose how you react to what happens to you people. You don't always have to be in victimhood competition. Uh, there's a saying that I have, you either run the game or the game is run on you. Yep. So there you go. I found I found a psychologist to actually agree with me on this. So this makes it official. Everyone, some people don't like that uh, that that 
that terminology and uh it's kind of interesting so uh we're going to delve more into this as we go through the show but uh let's get your origin story what made you want to be a psychologist and uh become a doctor uh with a phd and and uh everything else what, what's your hero's journey through your life my, my hero's journey is uh i went to college with the idea that i was going to be a dentist my father was a dentist my <laughs> grandfather was a dentist mm -hmm. so i was going to be a dentist and I get to college and all the classes I'm taking that are getting me toward uh, my pre-dent classes, I hate it. Organic chemistry, hated it. Biology, not a big <laughs> fan. Uh, chemistry is okay. I didn't mind chemistry that much. But I took Psych 101 as an elective mm -hmm. uh, and really enjoyed it. And then I said, oh, I'm going to take another psych class. I can. So I took Psych 102. And before I knew it, I had a minor uh, in psych. So... I just decided in the, the class that really sold me on it uh, was an abnormal psych class I took with a gentleman who was at the time the president of the American Psychological Association. Oh, wow. He was, he was a dynamic lecturer, brilliant man. And I kind of fell in love with psychology at that point. So I decided, I'll, well, I'll be a psychologist. There you go. You found then, you. Once you get an undergraduate degree in psychology, about the only thing you can do with it is either get a graduate degree or I don't know, not, not much else. Mm -hmm. uh, and then was your PhD in the same venue or my, no, I went to case Western reserve, which is in Cleveland. And I went to mm -hmm. Georgia uh, for my master's and PhD. Cause I got sick of the winters in Cleveland <laughs> and <laughs> decided to lost the Cleveland crowd, man. All five people went. No, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> The people in Cleveland know I love Cleveland. It's a great place go. to be from, but I'm glad I'm not there now. Yeah, I think we saved it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I got my PhD, and that I was going to be a college professor. So I did that for four years. Uh, huh. in, the, in the late 70s, I was a college professor at Oklahoma City University and uh, taught psychology, loved it, ended mm -hmm. up being promoted to chairman of the department after my first year there, which I was totally unprepared for. Um, so I did that for a while. And in 1979, I realized you can't raise a family on uh, what I was making as a college professor at a small liberal arts school. So I joined a consulting firm mm -hmm. and, uh, in, they moved me to my, to the Memphis office. They were, it's RHR international, great firm, love them to this day. They moved me to Memphis and taught me how to work with businesses. So I started consulting with businesses, helping them uh, get better on the people side of their business. Many executives are great at running their business, but they're not good at reading people. So I help those businesses hire the right people, develop the people, and also develop their own leadership skills. There you so, go. So leadership kind of go, go ahead. Leadership skills are really important because – uh, in being able to understand people, because as you do in your consulting, help people build the right teams and stuff. How do you how do you help people uh, with their leadership? How to build the right teams and identify people that have the psychological fit for your team? Like most of my most of my team are all insane sociopaths. So, uh, but they fit, they work with me well because well, I'm that's, the, that's the culture <laughs> that you discovered the secret. That's the culture of your organization. So you want to have people like. <laughs> Who fit that culture? That's the some some <laughs> yeah, true. Uh, uh, the some, truth comes out. Some people, some organizations, every organization has its own personality. Mm -hmm. If you can understand what that person, that's the culture of the organization. Oh. How they do things, how they treat them. A culture of an organization is basically how does an organization treat its people and how do those people treat each other? Oh. Some companies are real task oriented, some people companies are real people oriented. Some people are process oriented and, you know, the companies that are demanding that employees come back to the office, mm -hmm. whether or not they really need to come back to the office, uh, are more process oriented, more profit oriented than they are people. oriented. Ah, and that probably gets communicated to their employees that like, hey, these guys give a crap more about dollars than us. Should they? There you go. That explains why they're so angry about sometimes yep. about getting that claw back to the office. So there you go. Uh, so do you mostly, do you do any private practice one-on-one -on -one with people like me where you're like, uh, you know, you sit me down and go, uh, 
why did your mother hate you when you were a child, or do you just mostly work with companies? <laughs> <laughs> I, I do work one on one with people, but it's in a coaching capacity. It's not okay. a therapy capacity. Okay. And the big difference between coaching and therapy is coaching's looking forward, and therapy spends a lot of time looking backwards before oh, we start moving okay. forward. And so, no, I, I really, I God bless the people who can do that. They they do great work. <laughs> I don't have the patience for it. I like working with business people. Uh, they're much more willing to put into practice ideas that you suggest um, yeah. because business people are going to, they're looking to make their business better. They're looking to make their customers happy, happier. They're looking to make their employees more productive and happier. Mm -hmm. A happy workforce is a productive workforce. It definitely is. I mean, if people feel like they're valued, if they, if they're inspired, uh, if they're if they're working towards a good purpose, you know, other than the sociopaths in my office, um, <laughs> including me, uh, you know, there's there's that. So um, in the book, you talk about several different things. We're going to fall back to that. Um, you you talk about forget about keeping up with the Joneses, uh, forget about winning the rat race, uh, or you know the FOMO that social media gives. You know, sitting around going, "Did I get a like? Did I get a like? Did I get validated? Did I get attention?" Uh, how do we start living for ourselves? The first step in living for yourself is to take care of yourself ah. and start to practice self-love. People think self-love is selfishness, and it's not the same thing. Self-love is, is recognizing that you have worth, you have value. Nobody's mm -hmm. more. Nobody cares about you as much as you care about you, and it's time for you to realize that. So you take care of yourself. You can't you can't take care of other people if you don't take care of yourself first. And if mm. you don't love yourself, why would you expect anybody else to love you? Because uh, I don't have any love for myself. Yeah. And can't people just fill the void? <laughs> <laughs> uh, there you go. I, that's that's really important uh, because uh, if you I mean. You, you do have to love yourself. You got to fill your bucket first. Um, you do. Know, on the cover of your book, you have different terms like self doubt, anxiety, frustration, and, and then it looks like uh, the pointing the same way your car is headed. Uh, you have the easy way. That's uh, it. Tell us what that all means. Well, the easy way is, as I said, taking care of yourself and recognizing what works for you. Instead of what works for everybody else. Ah. And, you know, take care of yourself physically. That means getting as good a shape as you can possibly get in without killing yourself. I'm not saying run a marathon. I had a line in my book that every dead body on Mount Everest was once a highly motivated person. <laughs> well, <laughs> so don't get carried away. But it's okay to take a walk every day. You want to take a walk in the woods? Walk a couple miles, get in touch with nature. You'll feel better. Your blood pressure will go down. Uh, and you'll start the day feeling a little bit uh, more optimistic and positive. Unless you meet a serial killer when you're in the woods. That's all. Well, it depends thing. on where you're walking. Central yeah. Park is a little different situation. <laughs> there are a lot of places in the country where you can walk and not worry about getting killed. Yeah. Yeah. But, Note to uh, self, stay out of the killing forest. Yes, know. absolutely. Really stay out right now. Um, so there you go. Uh, and uh, so give us, uh, uh, you work with companies to teach them to be better leaders. You do coaching. You've got some courses on your website. Uh, and uh, coming soon, it looks like, on the courses. Yeah, uh, cool. Walk us through when you coach people. How do you work with them? What are, what are some of the biggest things that you find people are coming to you with needs going, I really need help on this, that, or the other? Well, when people don't come to a coach or the same, and they don't go to a therapist unless there's some pain. There's something that, uh, that's not quite right. Mm. And uh, for the more proactive leaders, they recognize that they've reached a certain point in their career mm -hmm. where if they're going to go to the next step, they're going to have to build some additional skills. Mm. or change their mindset a little bit. Many people who get very successful in kind of the middle of their career are individual producers. They're really good at their job. So they achieve, they achieve a fairly high level of success doing their job. Mm. But if you're going to be a leader, 
you have to get your jollies. You have to get your success from other people's success. Hmm. I mean, yeah. they can't, you can't achieve what you want to achieve unless the people working with you are achieving something, achieving mm -hmm. what they want to achieve. Mm -hmm. So that's the part of the gap that I try to bridge is going from getting your satisfaction from what you do to getting your satisfaction from what you can inspire other people to do. Ah, there you go. Uh, so uh, what do you find uh, is the biggest difference between successful and unsuccessful leaders? What makes a, a leader unsuccessful? It's, there, it's almost an axiom at this point, but there, it's true that successful people are willing to do the unpleasant but necessary things that unsuccessful people aren't willing to do. Ah. Successful leaders will sacrifice their own uh, status or whatever to make the team better, to make their customers mm -hmm. happier. They're, they have a, a helping spirit. They have a giving mindset. They have uh, the customer... The, old, the customer is always right. It's, it's still true. The customer is always right. Mm -hmm. um, but they have the idea that their best, their first customers are their internal customers, the people that work with them. Oh. So those leaders are always thinking about what can I do to make the internal customer experience as good as possible, help them be as productive, as happy mm -hmm. as possible, and they'll take care of the external customers. That's very true. I, I really love that analogy because people don't realize that if you take care of your people, they're going to take care of the front line better. So is is thinking of your employees as as a, a form of customer, a better way of, of uh, putting into your mindset? Well, it, it is because nobody, if you think about how you treat your customer compared to how you, you might treat your employees, if you treat, you're going to, you're not going to do anything to intentionally irritate, aggravate, drive away, piss off your customer. So why would you do things that irritate, aggravate, piss off your internal employees? Note to self, quit pissing off the employees for fun on Fridays. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we'll see if we can do that. <laughs> That's probably a bad idea. Uh, and, and, you know, stuff like calling people back to the office, trying to force them to do stuff they don't want to do, treating them poorly, showing that, you know, layoffs are more important than everything else. Uh, one thing you help companies do is find the right uh, people to hire. What right. should companies look for when they're hiring new employees? And uh, uh, why is it important to care about that? Um, and uh, what do you, how do you help people uh, do that well? Well, as I mentioned, every company has its own personality, mm -hmm. just uh, just like an individual has his or her own personality. And the mistake that companies make is they take in much too much into account skills and experience mm -hmm. and don't don't take enough into account attitude and personality. Mm -hmm. When you think when you think about. For example, a retail brick and mortar store that you might go into. And if you have a great experience with an employee there, somebody, a service, somebody on the staff, you're more likely to go back. there, Right. And if you have a bad experience, you're less likely to go back. there. Mm -hmm. It's not because the person who waited on you doesn't have the skills to do the job. They know the products. Mm -hmm. It's all about how they treat you, how they make you feel when you go into that store. Mm -hmm. Well, that's an attitude issue. Oh. That's not a skills issue. Oh. Yeah, so, if their attitude sucks. Right. Like, you know, I, you're making me think of a, a recent place that I really enjoy because the, uh, because the uh, owner's from Italy and he makes some spectacular Italian uh, pasta and, and that related food. And, uh, but Please they have- Please feel free to send some to me, by the way. Oh, okay. Well, uh, if I can get their service to serve it. Um, but the, the problem they have is they have some sort of, you know, you, you kind of do a weird order system up front and then you go sit at your table and then someone's supposed to kind of make sure your drinks are full. 
but then they just kind of yell at you and go, Hey, just let us know if you need anything. And you're just like, but you're paying for full service pricing. Right. It's kind of interesting. And uh, it, it's really a turnoff. It was making me think of one of my experiences, but uh, it's interesting. And in, 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 so, you know, a lot of people who hire, you know, this will probably go on LinkedIn newsletter. So a lot of people who hire will pick it up. A lot of recruiters, um, a lot of recruiters and stuff, they focus on the skills base. And a lot of it, I might not even be skills based so much anymore. Is it like how, what, how long were you your last job and were you there for several years or whatever? Um, it, it seems like, you know, the wrong metrics being used there. Well, you you have to use some metrics to, to weed out sure. the thousands of candidates who are applying for mm -hmm. given jobs. Mm -hmm. But resumes, uh, to me, always seem like more like marketing documents. They're more like brochures than they are mini biographies. PR statements. So, so people have a tendency to embellish, exaggerate, I've or heard outright lie on their resume. And they're not going to put anything on their resume that paints them in a really bad light. So you have to dig that stuff out somehow. I, yeah. I put all my bad stuff on a resume and I'm like, fuck it. I warned them. So if they well, hire me. When was the last time you looked for a job? Either? Um, When I was 18, I think, or 20. <laughs> That's one of the great things about being self-employed. It is. <laughs> I, I'm unhirable and I do not oh, work with people. Sure. So there's yeah. that. I, I know the feeling. Yeah, yeah. Plus, I've been on. Plus, I've been on. Uh, what well, I, I can't pull this joke out of my head right now. I guess. I plus I've been on court detention for thirty years uh, or something. I don't know. <laughs> Most people don't know the podcast is really just a uh, uh, court determined community service. Uh, so there's that. Uh, but uh, uh, hiring for attitude and and and, and, and personality or personality. Well, what if personality? Personality is really important. You know, I've I've had experiences like I, I'm not a big fan of Walmart's new thing where I have to do all the checking out. Mm -hmm. um, I think next week they're going to start where I have to start uh, grabbing cases out of the back and shoving them on the shelf and then getting what I want out of them. That or eventually I'll just be the one who orders the stuff. Uh, I You know, I don't know where this goes, but it, it's really irritating. And so I'm a real asshole. I mean... I think most people know that by now, but I'll follow that up with the rest of that statement. I'm a real asshole at Walmart where I will ask for the hidden cashier that they've hidden on purpose. Uh, and I will ask for the cashier and demand to be checked out that way. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and they always come and they're always ho-hum and they're always upset at me over it. And they got an attitude and stuff. And I, I still don't care because I'm an asshole. And, um, uh, we <laughs> got that memo yet? I'm an asshole. Uh, but I had a guy one time who came out and he and he started being friendly with me in a great attitude. He's like, "Hey man, how you doing today?" I'm like, "I'm doing good, I'm doing good. I hate this process, but uh, we'll get through this." And and he was just so funny, interesting. He's like, "Hey, what's the hat about?" And, you know, uh, the Chris Foss show. And and uh, he goes, and I go, and I I was honest with him. I go, you know, you're making this fun. I actually really hate that Walmart does this. He goes, you know, I do too, Chris. He goes, but, you know, we'll get through it. We're going to have some fun with this. And he checked me out and stuff. His whole attitude and his his personality changed my whole, uh, my whole attitude towards the company for the most part, at least in that moment, and, and made my experience so much different. And that was the power of just someone having a great attitude and personality. Absolutely. And your interaction with that person, he was Walmart. Yeah. At that time. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So everybody working in a business, and I'm sorry, the light just went out in this office. It's got one of those timer things. It just drives me crazy. Um, anyway, everybody can be the face of their business, of mm -hmm. their company. Mm -hmm. And good companies for good in good companies, people go out and they're ambassadors for the place that they work. Yes, yes. And in bad companies, they're ambassadors for don't come to work there if you if you can help it. <laughs> uh, really, and and a lot of a lot of companies get their best employees get their best new employees by asking their current employees if they know anybody like them would like to come to work there. 
No, yeah. not my employees. When you see my employees, you're like, well, we I know they're sociopaths, this but that's yeah, okay. Yeah. Sociopaths. You know, that's, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's the profile. That's good. Yeah. Um, but good good people tend to hang out with other good people. Ah, there you go. Yeah, I, you know, I you mentioned that your employees are ambassadors, and that goes for everybody, I would imagine, not just your frontline commercial service people. Oh, everybody. Mm -hmm. for, for many for many people, the company is the receptionist that they see oh. when they walk in the door. Mm -hmm. If that person doesn't present the kind of image you want to the company, mm -hmm. that may be as far as that person ever goes in doing business with you. Yeah. Area, the person that answers the phone, and boy, do I hate the automatic phone <laughs> answering system where you got to hit four, five, six different buttons just to get to a live person if you can ever make it to a can find it yeah okay. yeah you don't end up down some rabbit hole uh you know like i saw recently there was a thing on tiktok that went viral where a guy was being uh, i think racist uh and and uh, i think uh yep yeah, i mean just basically racist and uh uh they they doxed him and came out you know he works for some big athletic college stuff and he'll probably get fired um you know that's one of those things and and it doesn't look like he's like a frontline person and so it's probably important for companies to recognize this you know the culture they have the people that work for them you know when they're out talking to people you know if you've got somebody who's got some serious issues you know they're out toxifying the world about you know your the people are looking at them going there must be more of them back at that company or this must be some sort of endorsed behavior kind of yeah. explains some of the canceled culture that we have it can, this, it, can uh, it can poison a company's reputation in the public it can uh, internally mm -hmm. and externally yeah even if you fire them and do the whole pr thing like oh we, that person's not like us you're like why did you let them work for you so for so long I imagine some people might ask oh yeah there you go. Uh, and, and hiring right is so important. One of the problems we had with our companies early on was we we hired everybody. You know, they came in for an interview and we're like, hey, you're pretty cool. We didn't hire everybody, but, you know, the good ones. But, you know, it was first it was a first interview sort of pickup. Uh, and then we find out, you know, they were lying. Or as you yeah. put it, you know, they, they, they embellished their resumes a little. Uh, and then we would have to go through the process of, of getting them out, you know two three steps you know all that sort of crazy stuff of writing people up and dealing with their thing and so we learned the hard way that by doing multiple interviews by really getting to try and flush out people's personalities their attitudes as you put it um doing three to four interviews made all the difference in the world it does so uh i i concur with what you're saying in that level yeah you, the the more different perspectives you can get on an individual and the more chances you're going to people, people come into interviews today, better prepared than they used to. They've <laughs> they've taken classes on how to, inter, how to get interviewed. Yeah. Or they've read a book on how to get interviewed. So you really have to dig deeper under the surface to get it an answer that they're not expecting, get it a, a question they're not expecting. Mm -hmm. uh, and whenever somebody, when I'm, I'm interviewing somebody, uh, and they sit back and say, oh, that's a good question. That means nobody's told them that question was coming. So, <laughs> so, I like that. I got to remember that one. So they got to think about it for a second. Uh, that's something they've got a canned answer for. So uh, I, always, I, I always like to get two or three, oh, that's a good question when I'm interviewing somebody. Ah, uh, there you go. Um, what are some other ways that you help business and leaders do more of what they do? Anything more you want to tease out on that? Well, um, we don't want your whole proprietary system. No, um, <laughs> it depends on what the leaders have in, having issues where there are shortcoming on. Mm -hmm. you know, some people have difficulty communication. I've coached leaders on how to be better public speakers before. Some oh, people, public speaking, as you know, can be very uh, anxiety inducing in people. Uh, I was, when I first started teaching, I, I was terrified. Mm -hmm. Um, but when you're teaching, you have to do it eight to 10 hours a week in the classroom every week. So you, you learn how to be better at it. The problem most people have is they have very few opportunities 
to get better at public speaking. You think about how many times, unless you're going to be preach at church or something, I don't know, give a speech at a rally. There aren't that many chances to speak in public. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I've coached leaders on that. I've coached leaders on how to be more assertive without being aggressive. Uh -huh. uh, there, are, there are a lot of different things you can work on, uh, how to be better communicators, how to, not to ramble when they talk, like I'm doing now. Um, <laughs> it's a podcast. We can yeah, I, I get it. It's legal. <laughs> I check with the laws. Yeah. Yeah, um, local laws. So, so it really depends what – some people – I've done uh, – a lot of coaching with people toward the end of their career for what what's the next phase of their career of their life i mean mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of people don't think about what if i have to retire at 65 because the company makes me retire at 65 what am i going to do with the next 15 20 25 years of my life oh the retirement age of 65 was created when people were dead at 61 or 62 <laughs> but now they're living into their 80s and 90s to um, 100 baby so if the only if the only thing that an executive enjoys doing is working he's going to have a real adjustment when somebody tells him he can't work anymore that's very true yeah i i've been people have been telling me that i shouldn't work anymore for the past 35 years so there's that um so there you go uh so what haven't we touched on about what you do and how you do it with people or, or any of the stuff that's in the book well the the, another message I like to leave in the book is if you accept yourself, you're going to get in better relationships. With mm. There's a whole chapter in, in my book on relationships. And I think the secret to good relationships is accepting each other's quirks. Everybody's got quirks. And if you find the other person's quirks endearing, you got a chance to be uh, in a good relationship if you don't find another person's quirks endearing, you may end up with what the police call motive. Uh, <laughs> wow, that escalated quickly. Yeah, that went right from uh, that went right to to murder there. Uh, you know, it, how do you deal with it? Oh, you're a psychologist. How do you? Do, one of the problems I have is I'll, I'll have somebody in a relationship where they'll be like, you know, uh, I have a whole list of your problems. We're going to talk tonight about them, and I'm like, oh, I didn't we're making a list now of things that are annoying about each other. Oh, so, okay. Oh, no. Well, I'll just, I'll do my list. just, just me. Yeah. 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 And wow. I'll be like, Oh, I, I guess we're playing the game. I should wait. There's things you don't like about me. I mean, right. if I really want to be an asshole about it. Yeah. I, I mean, if I really want to sit down and go like, there's things I don't like about you. Yeah. We can do that game, but I'm growing up enough to, to, you know, the, the good parts about you overshadow the, the parts that I find mildly annoying. Um, and <laughs> that's always an interesting conversation to have, oh, yeah. which is probably why I'm single all my life. Well, I, I shortcutted that process. Oh, did you? I yeah. did. Uh, I do, my first wife and I divorced after 20 years. <laughs> and uh, when I started dating my second wife, who passed away, I'm, I'm not a serial uh, marriage person, but yeah. oh, good, I'm back. What you referenced earlier with the motive now has me wondering. Yeah. Uh, hey, no body, no murder. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> um, she, she's probably going to listen to this, so yeah. God bless you, Sue. You're the psychologist, so you don't have to talk I somebody know. down off it. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, so I got divorced. I started dating my second wife, and I wrote down on a sheet of paper everything that was wrong with me. And some of that was based on what my late wife or my ex-wife said some of it was for me and i said here if we're going to get serious this is everything that's wrong with me if you don't think you can live with this let me know now and we can go our separate ways it'll be just fine mm -hmm. and she said let me see the bank account next to the uh list and uh, i'll make a decision right yes well so that, that was that was that was on a different list oh it, it was definitely on a list yeah. wow there you go. Uh, so she still accepted you. That's pretty good. Yes. And yeah. the, the punchline of that story is we got married. We moved into a house. And one of the light sockets uh, switches didn't work. She, she, I got home from work. She said, will you fix the light switch? I said, no. She said, what do you mean, no? 
I said, no, it's on the list. It's number seven. I don't do home repair projects. <laughs> so I thought you were kidding. I said, no, call an electrician. They need to make a living. <laughs> so I'm not doing it. I've had relationships like that. Like, why don't you mow the lawn? I'm like, we pay people to do that. I don't, mm-hmm. I don't do that. Um, and then, you know, like, why don't you do the dishes? Oh, that's what you're here for. Um, so there you go. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at least you gave her a full disclosure. I did. Um, it yeah. sounds like it sounds like maybe you should have had like a contract written up with attorney advisories and, you know, signed notary, all that sort of good stuff so that she knew you weren't joking around. Every relationship's a contract, whether you know it or not. There you go. I there's if I start a relationship again, ever uh, long term, there's going to be all that stuff you heard at the beginning, like I love you no matter what. There's nothing you could do. You're the Superman. I'm gonna all that's going to be like uh, videotape depositions, so that later, a year later, when all that bullshit comes back, like I hate how you do this, and I'll be like. Uh, tape number one, please. The deposition of yeah. the starting of the relationship. Let's get that up front. I don't know why I'm doing Bill Cosby. Um, pudding bops. So there you go. Uh, don't drink what we're serving here, people. Uh, so, uh, Angelo, uh, give us your final thoughts, your pitch out to people or if your book, get to know you or your services online, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Sure. If you want to laugh, first of all, the book's funny. And it's got plenty of wisdom, and it's only less than 100 pages. Get You're Making This Way Too Hard. Find your easy way to enjoy life, and you will get end up with some nuggets that will live with you for a long time. You can reach me at AngeloValenti.com. Uh, you, uh, you can book a discovery call at ReachAngelo.com. You can also check out my consulting services at TheCompanyPsychologist.com. And check me at Facebook at Angelo Valenti, LinkedIn at Angelo Valenti, PhD. Uh, and I'd love to hear from you. There you go. There you go. It's been wonderful, Angelo, to have you on the show. Thank you. I've had a blast. Thank you. It's been fun. And uh, order up his book, wherever fine books are sold. You're making this way too hard. Find your way. Find your. I'm sorry. Let's cut That's that okay. again. You're making this way too hard. Find your easy way to enjoy life and it starts uh, with the uh, warning do not open this book if you are happy with being unhappy so uh give give up being unhappy it's it's overrated seriously folks uh find a way to be happy that's more important uh thanks Mountains, for tuning in go to goodreads.com for chess chris foss linkedin.com for chess chris foss youtube.com for chess chris foss the big linkedin newsletter the 130,000 linkedin group subscribe to all that over there and all that good stuff Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe, and we'll see you guys next time.